And the truth is, the things we've been doing with deep learning are remarkable engineering achievements. Like a decade ago, no one could have foreseen that you could do so much by just feeding parametric models, just gradient descent. Uh, it's crazy to think about it. And the, the thing is, however, is that none of this really brings us one inch closer to generality. In the same sense that, you know, uh, Deep Blue in the 90s was superhuman at chess, but it did not bring us closer to general AI. Uh, we are still exactly as far to general AI uh, today as we were 10 years ago, even though we've made this fantastic progress uh, on, the, on the various task basic systems. And that's because there's a big difference between a task basic skill and generality. A skill or, or behavior is the output of a process, and that process is intelligence. Intelligence is a skill acquisition process or a behavior generation process, which is basically the same thing. And do not confuse skills uh, as a process, and that process is intelligence. Intelligence is the acquisition process or a behavior generation process. I'm near myself, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mute uh, my computer. So if you're saying something, I'm not gonna <laughs> not gonna be able to hear. Um, yeah, so there's a big difference between a process uh, and its output. Uh, like there's a difference between a car and a car factory, for instance. The same kind of difference. It's the, the, these objects are in different categories. If you buy a car, you can go to various places, but it does not mean you've solved the problem of uh, vehicle manufacturing. And in particular, modern AI, uh, deep learning based AI, has stark limitations that reveal that it's not close to generality. In fact, it's not even close to being uh, flexible. Uh, it's data hungry, like we can solve any task, uh, but only given a dense sampling of every possible situation uh, that pertains to the task. And it does not really withstand very well contact with the real world because the real world is highly variable, uh, changing and surprising. And as uh, these systems are also a uh, one, they're sensitive to small perturbations. Uh, they only work on data that stays very, very close to what the system has been trained on, uh, what it's been programmed to do. And here are a few uh, concrete examples to illustrate this. Uh, even if you have access to millions of hours of driving data from an entire fleet of cars, and that's like you know four or five orders of magnitude more data than what a human would use to learn to drive, the best you can do uh, on self-driving is signal about uh, L2 to L3, uh, which is very far from being able to handle, you know. Uh, arbitrary situations on the road, that would be L5, and L5, you know, is still considered to be decades away, uh, according to, for instance, the folks at Waymo. Um, and you can also look at video game playing. Uh, like a couple of years ago, OpenAI uh, trained a big deep learning model to play Dota 2 at superhuman level. But here's the thing, uh, that system needed to be trained on 50,000 years of gameplay data, which is obviously a lot more than, than what a human would need. And, once the system was released, random people found ways to reliably uh, beat the AI, uh, win against it in a matter of days. Um, we can also look at domestic robotics, which is at this time pretty much entirely a greenfield area, even 10 years after the start of the deep learning revolution. So we are still very far away from solving the Steve Wozniak test of intelligence, uh, which is to have a robot that could enter a random kitchen and figure out how to make a cup of coffee. So what has led us here? Uh, let's talk about the shortcut rule, which is a well-known principle of system design that says that if you start optimizing for a specific metric, you will take shortcuts along every possible dimension uh, that is not uh, captured by your metric. And that's very similar to overfitting in machine learning. Uh, a simple illustration of this effect uh, can be seen in Kaggle competitions. So Kaggle is this uh, uh, very large, uh, very popular machine learning competition website. And um, when uh, people you know, enter these competitions, they optimize for the evaluation metric of the competition. And as a result, the systems that they create cannot be used in production settings typically because um, they took shortcuts along every other dimension other than the evaluation metric, like you know, computing requirements, uh, code maintainability, and so on. And in AI, what the shortcut rule means is that if you focus on task specific skill, uh, you will achieve task specific skill, but you will do so by taking shortcuts. And so you will end up with a system that does not display 
uh, generalizable recurrency abilities because skill is orthogonal to generalization power. Uh, if you can generalize, then you can develop new skills. You can go from the general to the specific, but in reverse, there is no path from the specific to the general. And it's not possible to come up with a specific task or a specific metric that would require broad abilities. Because if you fix the task, then you open the door to shortcuts. And there's a famous story in the field of AI, which is the story of uh, Alan Newell. Uh, in 1973, he proposed that the field of AI should focus on chess, solving the problem of chess playing. Because chess in humans uh, features memory, learning, reasoning, analysis, and so on. So the reasoning was, if we can solve chess, then surely uh, we would have um, to understand all these different cognitive mechanisms. We could not possibly solve chess without uh, solving you know, memory, learning, reasoning, analysis, and so on. And eventually we did solve chess, but it turned out uh, that did not actually teach, teach us anything about human cognition because we had fixed the task. And so therefore we were able to take shortcuts and solve the task. And today the modern version of this story is to increase uh, task physics skill on a problem by adding more training data. Uh, which reduces the need for generalization power. It's always possible to create shortcuts to solve a given task without featuring intelligence, without requiring generality or generalizable connectivity. And you do so by reducing novelty and uncertainty. Uh, since intelligence is all about being, being able to handle novelty and certainty, things you haven't seen before, if you just provide a more complete description of the task, you reduce the need for intelligence. And in the limit, you do not need any intelligence to solve any task, as long as the task is fixed, as long as it's static. Um, and so you, you provide a more complete description of the problem via injection of information about the task. So that could be priors, like for instance, hard-coded rules, uh, explicit human-created models, or that could be training data. Um, an example is you know, learning to play uh, Dota, as I was mentioning, a couple of slides ago. So a few years ago, OpenAI trained this uh, deep learning model on uh, 45,000 years of gameplay. And that system was actually superhuman in some respects, but it was very brittle in the end. People very quickly figured out how to reliably beat it. So it could not also you know, adapt to simple rule changes. Uh, like let's say you introduce a new character in the game, or you, you change the rule, you say uh, towers in, in Dota 2 now they insta -kill. If you're a human player, you can adapt to a change like this uh, pretty much instantly in a single game. Like you, can, you can master a, a new character in like you know, one, two, two, three games uh, without expending much uh, uh, energy at all. Uh, on the other hand, a deep learning system would have to be retrained for thousands of years uh, uh, of additional uh, data. Uh, if you find it, it's still going to be still going to need a huge amount of data because the landscape of the problem has changed significantly in this simple, very simple rule change. And if the next small variation shows up, then you again, you have to retrain the system. So it is extremely inflexible. And that has very much been the history of AI for many decades. Like you take different problems like you know, chess, go and so on, and you find ways to solve these problems extremely effectively, but without displaying any intelligence. And I like to quote uh, Descartes on this. So Descartes uh, wrote something 400 years ago uh, before computing, which I think really captures the sense of the difference between an intelligent agent and an automaton. So something intelligent and something that is just uh, displaying task basic skill. And so this quote that predates the rise of AI by you know, several centuries, obviously. In fact, it slightly predates the first mechanical computers. Uh, the first mechanical computer was uh, the Pascaline, which was invented by Pascal, who was, uh, at the time of the publication of uh, Descartes' book, he was 14. So that was five years uh, before Pascal invented the first mechanical computer. And what Descartes tells us in this code is that an automaton uh, operationalizes abstractions that were provided by its creators. And on the other hand, an intelligent agent is able to produce its own abstractions, and therefore it can adapt to arbitrary situations and uh, the ability to adapt to, to you know, handle what's novel is really what characterizes uh, uh, intelligence. The automaton can only handle situations that match uh, the abstractions that we have imparted to it. And I really want to stress that the 
gen the generation uh, of autonomous abstraction, which is you know intelligence, that is orthogonal to the encoding and operationalization um, uh, of uh, human provided abstractions. And that's true whether you provide these abstractions in the form of hard coded rules or in the form of string data. Because in both cases, what you're doing is providing a full description of the task at hand, and that removes the need for the neural addiction. So intelligence is the ability to autonomously produce your own abstractions. And there's an immense gap between operationalizing pre-existing abstractions and developing your own abstractions autonomously, which should be the goal of AI. So really one thing I want to stress is that task six skill uh, exhibited by a system tells you nothing about its intelligence, about its generalization power. Uh, it's always possible to buy skill for a system that has a given level of intelligence simply by providing more information about the task, which reduces uncertainty, reduces novelty, and therefore reduces the need for generalization. And you do this by adding more training data or by uh, using human intelligence to produce pre-existing abstractions, which you can hard code into your system, which is what you would call uh, priors. And that's really what general intelligence means. It's the ability to adapt to the unforeseen, the ability to handle any new situation. And we've made basically zero progress on that problem, like not a little, literally uh, zero. And as long as we target task specific skill, we won't get intelligence because the shortcut rule will apply so we are not making progress on this problem because we have the wrong target. So we need to start targeting uh, generality itself. We need to start measuring uh, and, and trying to maximize uh, generalization and not you know, uh, 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 task-specific uh, uh, skill uh, success metrics. So what's generalization? You already know about it, you know, at least informally. And it broadly means the ability to handle situations or tasks that differ from previously encountered situations. Uh, so it's fundamentally the ability to deal with novelty and uncertainty. And that's precisely what you need intelligence for. And since generalization is defined in, in terms of uh, novelty and uncertainty, one thing to note is that novelty and uncertainty themselves should be defined with respect to a knowledge referential. So you can distinguish between two forms of generalization there's system-centric generalization, which looks at the, at the agent itself. And there's developer-aware generalization, which tries to zoom out uh, a little bit. The system-centric generalization is the ability to adapt to situations that the system itself did not previously encounter, while developer-aware generalization is the ability to adapt to situations that the creators of the system could not have anticipated. So for instance, humans adapt to arbitrary situations that the evolution process that produced humans has never seen. You know, a day in your life is unlike uh, any day in the life of uh, anyone before you, pretty much, but you can still handle it because you have general intelligence. And so obviously developer-aware generalization, uh, that's synonymous with autonomy. Uh, if you don't have developer-aware generalization, strong generalization, uh, you're, you're gonna be limited to predefined set of situations. Uh, uh, and today's systems, they don't have it, meaning that if they need to adapt, they need the help of a human engineer. And here's really what uh, I want you to uh, understand about uh, generalization, which is that it characterizes the relationship between, uh, on one hand, the information that you have, so that's your priors and your past experience, and uh, on the other hand, your operational area over the space of potential future situations that you might encounter, which are gonna feature novelty and uncertainty. So it's the efficiency with which you operationalize past information in order to deal with the future. And you can interpret it as a conversion ratio. And if you like equations, you can actually use algorithmic information theory to precisely quantify this ratio. Uh, I wrote a paper about it, so that if that's interesting, you can check that. That's uh, beyond the scope of this. Um, and uh, so one thing uh, that's interesting to note is that uh, generalization you know, is not a, a binary property of a system where either you have a system that can generalize or it cannot generalize. That's not how it works. It's actually a spectrum. And you can categorize AI systems by their level of generalization. On the lowest end, you have software systems that uh, 
don't have to adapt to vast expanse. They are static systems operating in a world that does not feature novelty or uncertainty. Then on the second level, uh, you have robust AI, which corresponds to uh, the statistical learning definition of generalization. So it's robustness to known dimensions uh, of variability, like the ability to handle a new sample from a known static distribution. And all of ML falls into this category today, uh, including all deep learning systems. And then you have flexible AI, which is the ability to handle a broad domain of activity in an autonomous fashion, including the ability to deal with situations and tasks that the creators of the system could not have anticipated. And for instance, L5 self-driving falls into this category. Uh, domestic robotics uh, also falls into this category. So uh, domains where uh, you have a variety of uh, different tasks and uh, you have a, a, a very high uh, variety uh, and uncertainty related to the uh, uh, operational environment. So you're, you're going to face situations that no one has faced before, basically, that could not have been anticipated. And finally, you have extreme generalization, which corresponds to open-ended intelligence. So that's a system that's capable of adapting to arbitrary domains uh, arbitrary tasks that obviously the creator of the system could not have anticipated. And currently that's uh, the exclusive domain of uh, biological intelligence. I'm not gonna say human intelligence because there are definitely uh, non-human biological intelligence that is probably uh, at this level of very close. And uh, a cool thing to note about this spectrum is that it actually mirrors the history of progress in AI. In the early days in AI, we were mostly looking at problems that did not uh, involve generalization, that's symbolic AI. And then we saw the rise of machine learning, which is concerned with uh, local generalization. So that's to say, you know, generalizing to a new sample from a known setting distribution. And uh, more recently, we are starting to look at systems that can deal with the viability and the uncertainty of the real world beyond machine learning. Typically, these are hybrid systems uh, that, uh, that leverage both uh, symbolic models uh, and deep learning uh, models, because the real world is not uh, a static distribution. So deep learning is, is not actually a great fit to handle it. So we are looking at you know, self-driving, domestic robotics, and so on. So that's uh, broad AI, that's flexible AI. And eventually, you know, we may one day create uh, truly open-ended systems capable of the same level uh, of generality as humans and animals. Uh, that's the dream, so hopefully in, in a, it's not too far away. And uh, so this highlights the importance of being able to quantify where a given AI system lies on the spectrum of generalization. It is by measuring where we are that we'll be able to make progress. Uh, so earlier I was saying that skill cannot be used as a measure of intelligence because it's always possible uh, to buy skill for a system by simply providing a more specific description of the task at hand which you do by you know, providing priors or providing more training data. So if you're interested in measuring generalization power, you should not look purely at scale. You should control for priors and you should control for experience. And if you're interested specifically in comparing uh, artificial intelligence and human intelligence, then you should standardize on a shared set of priors. And uh, they are going to have to be human cognitive priors because those are, those are fixed. 